What's up if you have a pain with? So in 2009, number three, phylogeny and evidence of evolution. So notice this question is kind of old. So the structure of the question is going to look slightly different than what you'll actually see on the exam, but the content is still valid and it's still a useful question to look at. So phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species. The evolution of a species is dependent on changes in the genome of the species. Identify two mechanisms of genetic change and explain how each affects genetic variation. So whenever they ask us to give two, three, or a certain number of something, the readers can only grade the first numbers that we see. So in this question, the readers will only score the first two mechanisms of genetic change that you provide. Even if your second and third one are correct, you will only be able to get credit for that second one if the first one is incorrect. Um, so I recommend writing the first, the second, just so that the reader knows which ones your two are. Um, so take a moment, and there's a lot of answers on this. Think about what kinds of things can cause genetic change before I tell you the answer. So we're thinking about about things that will change the DNA sequence. We're thinking about things that will reshuffle the genes. We're thinking about um, things that are going to um, increase that variation in some way. So here are the different options of things you could have put here. So talking about a mutation, whether it be a point, frame shift, or insertion, or deletion, um, and how that affects the nucleotide sequence, or the protein structure, or gene expression, or just changes in phenotype. You can talk about duplication, so talking about the duplication of a certain gene or a chromosome um, and how that would cause divergence of a mutation. Um, talk about regions, um, transposons, those are going to change the crossover frequency or changing a certain chromosome structure. Um, you could also talk about the different things that happen during meiosis, crossing over, independent assortment, law of segregation, non-disjunction. Talk about um, sexual reproduction with random fertilization and how this is increasing our gamete diversity and increases the combinations we can have. You could talk about genetic drift, bottleneck, founder's effect, gene flow, isolation, allopatric speciation, non-random mating, the sympatric speciation, natural selection, all of these causing differential success and reproductive fitness and looking how the allele frequencies can change. So if you're mentioning one of those, you have credit. So the student says, changing genetics is a key factor in the theory of evolution. An unpredictable factor in this change is mutation. A random change in the genetics as an addition, substitution, or deletion can alter an organism's structure or behavior. The ability for these changes to pass on requires that the mutation occur in the sex cells. If an autosomal mutation does not affect the sex cells, then it will Will die with the individual. Mutations can be devastating or extremely helpful to a population depending on their circumstances and can sometimes create a new standard of sexual selection. Geographic isolation, often from changing migration paths or geological activity, can greatly alter the genetics of a population. When brought to a new pop environment, new challenges are brought to the population, their adaptations will be different than those in the original habitats or then their uh, counterparts remaining there. <laughs> Selection of different traits often occurs from predation and new found uh, food sources, leaving a genetically and phenotypically different population and can sometimes lead to speciation. Genetic similarities in a population. Okay. So the second one tells us to draw a phylogenetic tree that reflects the evolutionary relationships of a organism based on differences in the cytochrome C amino acid sequences and explain how relationships of the organisms. And then based on that data, we're going to identify a couple things. So what they'll do on the exam is they're going to give you this data. These are amino acid differences in cytochrome C. In case you don't know about cytochrome C, it is a protein that's found in the mitochondria on the electron transport chain. And so this is going to be highly conserved. As you see, there's not a lot of differences in amino acids amino acid structures, okay? So what you're looking here is the organisms that are closely related, looking at the number of differences being a small number. Um, so if you look here, we see the horse and the donkey have one difference between them, and we see the chicken and the penguin have three differences. That tells us that the horse and the donkey are closely related, and that the chicken and the penguin are also closely related. So what they'll do is they'll give you this phylogenetic tree, and they're going to ask you to fill it in. So we know the horse and the donkey are closely related, so we're going to put those together on one of these branches. And then we know the chicken and the penguin are also closely related, so we'll put those on the other two branches. And then the snake is left over, so we'll put the snake there. The snake will be considered our outgroup because it is going to be um, least similar to the other organisms. It's going to have the most amino acid differences, um, and so we would call this our outgroup. This question is not specifically asking us for the outgroup, but I did want to mention it since I had that moment. Now, notice here that the 
branch point. So the horse and the donkey, we arbitrarily put them in that order. So you are able to ship those and actually that could have been horse, donkey. And same thing here, there's a branch point. So that could be rotated to give us the chicken and the penguin. But uh, look right here, there's another branch point. So technically we could rotate both of those groups, keeping them together and it can rotate giving us horse, donkey and then chicken, penguin. And so here's the student. Um, they actually drew the phylogenetic tree because back in the day you actually had to draw it yourself. Um, but nowadays they've been giving us a phylogenetic tree or they've been giving us a cladogram completely blank that we just fill it in. So here's the student's answer, got full credit there. Now we're supposed to identify which organism is most closely related to the chicken and explain our choice, as well as we're supposed to explain the relationships of the organisms. So we wanna talk about how the more differences that we have, the less related they are, or talking about that the fewer the differences, the more closely related they are. We wanna know the pick, the penguin is most closely related to the chicken. And we know that because there are three amino acids differing between the chicken and the penguin, which we looked at a moment ago when we were looking at that original diagram, okay? So student says the genetics similarity and the organisms can point to this degree of relation and how recent a common ancestor might be. Based on the differences in cytochrome C in these organisms, it would seem that the donkey and the horse are very closely related and already obvious from the hybrid viability in the two, as well as the chicken and the penguin. The snake is the furthest related from all of them. This makes sense as the donkey and the horse are both members of mammalia and the chicken and the penguin are both members of aves. It appears the penguin is most closely related to the chicken since it has the furthest, sorry, fewest differences of cytochrome C. So then part C tells us to describe two types of evidence other than comparison of protein that can be used to determine the phylogeny of organisms. And then we want to come up with the strength of each of those types of evidence. So you have to think about all the different evidence that there is about um, for evolution. So talking about fossils, talking about homologous structures, talking about embryology, um, talking about uh, biogeography. Um, you could be looking at the, the DNA changes instead of looking at the protein changes. So those are all different options you could have here, talking about the fossils, homology, looking at morphology or embryology, looking at the DNA sequence, looking at the biogeography, looking at like direct observations of their behaviors. And of course, most of these strengths all connect back to that we're looking at a common ancestor. So if you need to look over those, you can pause. Um, and here's the student says, and sorry, <laughs> you can pause. So the student says embryology is another way to observe the relation of organisms, especially mammals. Similar as embryonic structure and appearance support the notion of a more recent common ancestor and can be very uncanny to note in photographs just how similar we are as embryos. Homologous structures of organisms link them together in their adult forms. It's visible in the forearm and hard bones of chordates. The bones in the bat's wing here a bear bear striking resemblance and structures to those of the human hand this promotes the idea of a common ancestor and can highlight the deviations from it very graphically so hope that was helpful remember ap by paying was just success bye y'all